Welcome to the Refugee Portal Podcast, recorded at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. My name is Tarek. And I'm Yusuf. The Refugee Portal Podcast interviews, shares, and learns from the stories of refugees, as well as the perspective of academics, humanitarian workers, members of government, and other stakeholders. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the interviewees and do not necessarily reflect those of the Refugee Portal Podcast or its hosts. All right, let's get right into it. Our guest today, Nabil Ali, is here to talk about the humanitarian work his organization, the International Development and Relief Foundation, or IDRF, is doing around the world. IDRF has just celebrated its 35th anniversary in 2019, and it has been rated a top 25 Canadian charity for two years in a row. The founding members of IDRF were moved by news of the suffering caused by the African famine in the mid-80s and organized to help those in need. Since then they have been able to carry out relief and development projects in 45 countries across the world, including in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, the Middle East, the Americas, including Canada, which has resulted in impact for millions of people, including 650,000 in 2019 alone. Nabil is the programming director of IDRF. He leads the strategic planning of their programs department with the aim of ensuring organizational growth and expansion of activities. He is involved in identifying new and innovative ways to expand the scope, impact, efficiency, and efficacy of IDRF's programmings, and he is personally conducting extensive field visits to each of IDRF's major regions of operations, the Americas, Middle East, South Asia, and Africa, to meet with partners, undertake project delivery activities, and support growth and expansion. His experience traveling to regions of humanitarian crisis or conflict around the world forms much of our conversation today, including his experiences in Africa, Turkey, and Bangladesh. In today's interview with Nabil, we take a look at the projects IDRF has been a part of, and we hear the stories of aid workers who are helping refugees and others all over the world. Welcome to the podcast, Nabil. And uh, Nabil, we've known each other, I think, for over a year or two, and we got uh, introduced doing humanitarian work uh, for um, a number of different causes, uh, Yemen, and uh, I think upcoming there's some wells uh, for, for Pakistan, for Yemen, and uh, for Somalia. And so... Uh, let's let's maybe dive into uh, IDRF itself being a Canadian humanitarian aid agency and maybe talk about the history and the vision and the mission of IDRF. No, most certainly. And, and I thank you all very much for having me uh, on the podcast. I've listened to some of the other episodes and uh, it's really interesting, some of the topics and, and how cross-cutting it is. I think I'm excited for the future uh, of the podcast, but also I really uh, tip my hat to you guys for all your hard work and your efforts in really showcasing the work of humanitarians, people in the healthcare space, um, and also those working towards achieving our sustainable development goals. So I do do commend you all for that. Thank you. So, um, yeah, I so, yes, I'm going to be I'm the Director of Programs at IDRF. IDRF stands for the International Development and Relief Foundation. We are a Canadian charity uh, that empowers disadvantaged people from around the world. So IDRF was actually founded in 1984. And uh, it was founded by the late Dr. Fahad Shaheen, who's recently passed away. And um, it was founded in response to the East Africa's famine at the time, during the mid-80s towards the early 90s. And uh, at the time, there were a group of doctors here in the GTA, uh, um, the greater Toronto area, and they really wanted to think about a way of supporting those overseas through whether it be food aid or emergency response of some sort. So they launched the International Development and Relief Foundation. Now, if you fast forward 35 years later, IDRF has been in over 40 countries all around the world. Uh, we are mandated to do work um, regardless of someone's religion, background, creed, or gender. Uh, we do all of our work without discrimination, and it's a secular uh, programming approach. We are founded on the Islamic principles of human dignity, social justice, and self-reliance. Um, and most recently, IDF has really built out a lot of our Canadian programming and we've received tons of accolades uh, for our work overseas, uh, rec- being recognized as a top 100 Canadian charity, uh, a top 100 Canadian charity in 2019, and also a top 25 Canadian charity. So we do a lot of work across different sectors as well, right? So IDRF is known for our work in the water space. So we do a lot of work in water, sanitation, and hygiene. We do work in emergency relief, in education, in healthcare, economic development, and food security. And if you just look at our stats from last year, which is also on our website, idrf.com, under annual report section, you'll notice that we help 
helped over 650,000 people last year. So we do, we are trying to hope uh, to you know ensure that we do support more people around the world, and we do so through taking a localized approach and uh, work through local partners for all of our implementation. And, and what's amazing is um, I know in that previous uh, project we did for Yemen uh, for a local uh, fundraiser that we did, I think, last April or May, um, mm. shortly thereafter was a detailed report. And so I think a lot of people today, uh, when they contribute to uh, causes and, and organizations like IDRF, uh, part of the transparency is to see where, where did the money go? How, do, how was it spent? How was it utilized? What was the impact? And the detailed report that uh, we received from IDRF uh, was amazing. It, it, it talked about all the families and, and exactly how much food and medicine and, and all the support that was provided in which, which actual city. And, and uh, so it was, uh, it was very detailed. And I I, I, because I've worked with uh, other humanitarian aid agencies, and I would say IDRF, uh, from what I've seen from a reporting standpoint, uh, and, and the speed in which you, you, you turned around the data after a few weeks of the funds being deployed, I, I thought it was uh, quite detailed and, and, and quite well done. No, I do appreciate that. And, and and I think we as a team, what we do here at IDRF is we put our programs first. Um, and we also recognize that um, the community is uh, the heart of the organization as well, right? The community here in Canada that helps, that helps IDRF survive 35 years and help us grow for 35 years. So what we always want to do across the board is to ensure that, A, everyone who supports IDRF recognizes that we support people um, around the world, regardless of who they are and where they are. It's ensuring that everyone who's in need, if IDRF can, support them, we will. And it's also letting every Canadian here know that we want to be as transparent, as efficient, and as effective as possible. And it seems so like... Do, uh, go ahead, Nabil. Yes, so I was just saying that if you... So if you look at it from that lens, our reporting is all, wants to always ensure that that's there. So any questions that donors may have, if anyone will donate, they want, to, they want to really recognize what is my dollar doing, right? What is the impact of my dollar? And we want to show that, hey, this is what this is what we're all about, and this is the support that you're giving. And it's really taking IDRF out of the picture and more so just kind of recognizing that, hey, a dollar can go this far in that space, and let's continue to do that. And it seems like the community has really responded well to the focus on transparency and impact uh, that IDRF has been uh, putting forward. Um, for instance, like uh, the revenue sources that you guys had have grown substantially over the last few years, if I'm not mistaken, from uh, 2019, you guys, 8 million, and 2018 it was 5.5 million so it looks like that people really want to give to IDRF and in Tark's experience it was that this this transparency this reporting this impact was what was motivating that yeah, very much so. It, is, it also kind of goes a step further, too, where a lot of our donations as an organization were um, private donations, right, through individuals and whatnot. However, now, yes, a lot of mosques are supporting us even more, and mosques have always been the bloodline of, of IDRF and from the very beginning. Uh, just different community groups, corporations, uh, different foundations have all kind of come together to support IDRF because we really are a staple uh, in, in, in Canada. We've been here for, for, for that long, and, and a lot of our work is... Since uh, 84? Yes, 84, yeah. And is it is it true that you started as the International uh, Refugee and Relief Program? Yes, yes, uh, that's, that's that's a great piece of history there. So yes, we did start off that way. It's actually, if you look at our incorporated documents, I believe it still says that. And uh, and that's how we were started off as an organization. And what's interesting about us uh, since then till now is refugee support services and programming will always be uh, a focus for us because um, IDF was founded on that and we recognize that it was very, very important to us back in 84 and till this day. So a lot of our programming till this day supports refugees across the board, whether they're um, refugees, Syrian refugees, whether they're refugees uh, in East Africa, across the board, uh, Rohingya refugees, we, we ensure that refugees continue to be a key pillar of our programming. And and it seems locally the, the accolades of being uh, by, I think it was the... the the National Post that rated uh, IDRF as one of the top financial one, post, financial or the, post. Fina uh, the financial post, which is part of the the National Post, to be uh, one of the top one hundred charities in Canada, and also the uh, uh, I think RBC Bank is a, is a strong supporter, uh, and you work with uh, a lot of major aid agencies like the UNHCR, Red Cross, Red Crescent. Mm. 
Yeah, very much so. So um, when, when, when looking at some of the accolades you received, yes, whether it be Charity Intelligence, Money Sense, Financial Post, they've all really recognized the work that we're doing off those three, transparency, efficiency, and effectiveness, and really kind of measuring and showcasing our impact, right? And, 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 and doing that in a way that tells our story as an organization to not only Canadians here and about Canadians here with our local programming, but also speaking about the work that we're doing overseas. Um, and, and, and that and RBC's support for IDRF has been, has been tremendous. This idea of an RBC, uh, RBC really was uh, a key champion of our Canadian programs, and they are a key champion of it through their Future Launch Initiative, which helps our Get Job Ready program that's in now five cities across uh, Canada, and also License to Learn, which has impacted over uh, 35,000 students in over 100 schools. So uh, we we are growing a lot of our Canadian programming, and, and it really just kind of it goes to show that you can really work across different levels, right, different spaces, and bringing everyone kind of together uh, towards a common goal of, of achieving our sustainable development goals and a common goal of supporting those in need. So whether it's bringing, you know, private private uh, donations or whether it's bringing in different religious groups or whether it's bringing in governments and corporations, it's all of us need to kind of work together if we are going to try to achieve our sustainable development goals. We have under 10 years to do so, and uh, the way and at our current rate, it doesn't seem like we're, go- we're going to achieve them. So it's important for us to kind of come together as a, as a as a global community and think about the fact that we are a globalized world at this stage and how do we work with one another to ensure that our efforts are all efficient and, and supportive. And what's amazing is IDRF operates in 45 countries across the world, mostly Asia and Africa, and, and obviously what you mentioned about Canada. Let's let's talk about you for a moment because, Nabil, you're a dynamic uh, uh, person in terms of our, our communication over over uh, the, the time we've worked together. That uh, How did you get into this? How did you develop a passion for this kind of work and your personal mission for the service that you do? Well, that's a great question. Um, I... So essentially where my passion for this came, I, 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 I always remember uh, being very young and just watching uh, the news on the weekends. I'd sit, sit at home with uh, some of my other siblings. I have, I have a big family. We have my eight siblings. And, and I'd, I'd be younger and we'd be flipping through the different channels on the weekends. And I would see on... Like on on some of the on the weekends, you, if you guys can remember World Vision and whatnot, and Save the Children used to have their their sponsor a child programs that would go on for very long, and it would show children in, in Africa that that could be sponsored and supported, and I would just see these things, and they would just stay with me, and, and that vision would just stay there, and I always felt uh, I, I never really felt compelled by any of them per se, but I always felt as though there was support that needed to be given. I just didn't know if that was the right way of doing it, and at a young time, and I would always see things going on in the news and conflict and war and famine and I would I would always just be just very interested in that at a young age and I read a lot of books about it and, and I've, I have family that's that's been in the in the UN space and so I felt compelled by that stuff and uh Going through schooling here in the GTA, I'm a Toronto uh, born and raised, and and going through schooling, I never really felt my calling. I was going to go into spaces of medicine and sciences and whatnot, and I could do that work, but I never really felt my calling because I always felt more compelled uh, to figure out exactly why everything that I saw as a child in the news was always so horrifying and so mm-hmm. bad, and why things were so challenging, and and why there were children starving, and we needed to do a really large infomercial to kind of make sure that you know that that was solved. They just something would just never fit there. And Something was always wrong, and I always had a had an issue with it. Um, and only to then grow and connect through through just then I took uh, my undergrad in international development to further unpack that and understand it more. And a lot of engagement and volunteerism uh, really led me into this space. I uh, actually had my first job experience um, working in Somalia. I was initially going to go to South Sudan. Um, however, due to some conflict at the time there, I, I decided last minute to travel to Somalia. And I started my international experience there. After graduating from undergrad and postgraduate studies, I I went there and I I, I started off as as a research consultant, uh, trying to really understand the landscape of Somalia, recognizing that it's a nation that has had a very uh, challenging history, whether it be through piracy in one space or uh, conflict, whether it's now terrorism and then natural disasters and famines and and you name it. Somalia has had a 30 years of a very very challenging uh, time. So I went into that uh, to really understand 
understand what was going on and how I can be of value to the space. And I work primarily with UNICEF under their rapid education assessment team to really figure out, hey, well, how many schools are in the region? How many students are attending schools? Uh, what is the current infrastructure? What's the curriculum look like? Well, how are we safeguarding their rights? How are we being supportive? And I let, let a large research study there, and I spent a lot of time in that region, Somalia and Kenya and Ethiopia, and, and, and felt as though this was a way for me to give back and better understand the space and, and really connecting that back to being young. Um, so, yeah, I, ever since then, I've, I've done that, and, and uh, while being in the field, decided to uh, come back home uh, to Canada, and, and IDRF at the time was 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 was, uh, was offering a position, and then I was able to, to jump on board, and now and I've been with IDRF for now uh, over four years, and, and I love it here. We've been able to do amazing things, and uh, and I'm able to kind of continue that passion and, and that drive that I've always felt uh, really compelled to go after. And, and give me a, some examples of firsthand impact that you've seen in the countries you've been to and, and just with the direct work that, that you've uh, been responsible for through IDRF, like that, that impact on the ground of, of benefiting someone's life. Yeah, I mean, some, I, was, I, I, I remember really... Uh, this this always stays in my mind. I was I was in Somalia, and uh, this is just before I left to join um, IDRF at the time. And and one of the things that I saw was uh, we were in a refugee camp, and we were just doing an assessment. And uh, we just finished our assessment and collected a lot of information. And and we were driving out out of the camp. And as we were driving away from the camp, there was a man who was chasing our van, uh, holding his son in his hands as as he chased the van. And he would he ran after us for for a little while. And eventually we stopped to figure out what was going on. And only for us to open the door and him to hand us his child to say, hey. I don't have support services, I don't have a job, I don't have any means of income, uh, no food or no way of supporting this child further. I've lost children already, I don't want to lose another. Can you please take my boy? And, and, and take him somewhere, uh, whether it be an orphanage, somewhere else, because I do not want to lose another child in my hands. And did he know who you were? Or, like, did he, he know who you guys he were? Knew we were? He knew we were aid workers. He knew we were aid workers. He knew we were in the air, area to do aid work, uh, you know, do assessments so we could provide additional services and whatnot. But it just went to show me how... But not personally. He didn't personally know you guys. No, he didn't know. He did not personally so know So he us. was willing to give his son to you guys and trust that he would... Wow. Exactly. And it... and all because he saw so much pain, right? He lost so much children, and now he didn't want to lose another in his hands because he had no, no, no other way of providing support. And, and that, to me, was like, that's when I recognized in my mind that whether you're in these emergency spaces, you need to really think about how do you support people long-term in addition to supporting them now. It's, you meet their immediate needs, but also ensure that their long-term supports are there. So now fast-forwarding to now with IDRF, a lot of the work that we do, for example, with the Rohingya refugees when we were in the camps, uh, I went there with uh, my colleague Ilyas, uh, who at the time was managing the projects. We went to Bangladesh, we went to the Rohingya camps, we were in Taknaf, for example. And what we saw there was we were distributing a lot of food, right? At the time, this is during 2017, late, uh, yeah, late 2017, early 2018, we were doing a lot of food distributions. As a globe, a lot of us galvanized together to recognize that there's a major influx to do to, to, to the genocide happening in Myanmar. And a lot of people came to Bangladesh. And so we went into the Rohingya refugee camps in, in Cox's Bazaar. And one of the things we saw was that everybody was getting food, but a lot of the homes were built and they, they were four sticks in the floor with paper black garbage bags wrapped, wrapped around them um, to make a home. And they were using, they'd use garbage, old boxes and whatnot to make a makeshift home. And they're all on these, these hills, right? They're on slopey hills. And, and that's where people lived. And you'd go into one and you'd see five or six people living in there. It'd be very hot, uh, unsanitary. It just was not a, a safe space for anyone to live. And it was, it was way too small. But we, were, but we were giving them a lot of food. So we knew, okay, well, right now this food's immediate, right? You need this right now to save your families and for current support. But what does that long-term support look like? What happens when the monsoon rains come? What happens to all these homes here? Uh, what, what about the safety and security of the women inside these homes, right? These are extended family members at times you're living with. Like, what, is the, what does that look like? Um, a lot of these women are 
are pregnant. So what is what kind of support services do they have? So um, what we decided to do as IDRF is we built homes, where we built we built uh, bamboo shelters at the camps, in the camps for for people that were uh, living in these makeshift shelters. But and we did them on on flat surfaces to ensure that even if it did rain, that you know their homes wouldn't 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 you know slide down the hills or anything like that. So it was to kind of think of hey, how do you safeguard people's rights? How do you connect that? And also how do you think long term so that you also are bridging the short term immediate. Uh, humanitarian efforts their long-term support services and and you've been directly on the ground like literally um when i spoke to you last you you were in turkey uh so now in the news uh with the the conflict happening in uh, in, idlib. in syria and uh, and idlib and the situation of the 3.6 million uh, refugees previous on the the turkey syria border and now with an influx of several hundred thousand more so you're on the ground you see firsthand what the issues are and, and shifting to now current events, um, tell us about your, your, your recent trip and what you've seen on the ground. Yeah, you're very, very right there, Tarek. I, I literally was, I got back uh, two days ago. I was uh, there for about a week. I, our, our, the purpose of our trip was to go uh, as we off, often do, to do some monitoring and evaluation to go see how our programs are doing. But because also there's been a lot of friction and, and, and some challenges, we knew what was happening in, in, in the buildup of us going. So uh, we decided to still take the trip, and we went uh, into Turkey. And we went there for two pieces, uh, uh, for two reasons, one of them being the Uyghur refugees that are currently in, in, in Turkey, and which I can cut back to, but more so around the Syrian conflict. So we went along the border. We flew from Istanbul. We went to uh, Kilis, and then from Kilis we went to the border region there. Um, surprisingly, though, the night before our flight was the night when 33 or 34 Turkish um, armed forces were killed. Wow. Um, and and they were killed, uh, yeah, they were killed in Syria. So um, in retaliation, Turkey decided uh, to kill hundreds of individuals um, uh, within Syria, right? And and so there was, we were right in the middle of that. And, and so once we got there, there was a lot of uncertainty in the air amongst those living in Turkey at the moment. Turkey is home to millions of Syrian refugees, and there there, there was a lot of ambiguity, right? Because you're now in this country that you know that. That, that that there are people there that, that feel very passionate about what, what had happened to some of their armed forces in Turkey. Um, no one knew where this was going to go, and it was a very it was a very challenging time. So we were able to go in there to make a bit of an assessment to understand what the needs are. There are a lot of challenges right now in Idlib. There are a lot. There's a lot of fighting going on. Uh, a lot of the people are moving up north, uh, Zaz and Aleppo, um, and that's where a lot of people are, are, are aren't going to go get some aid. And that's where IDF is right now on the ground, or where we're providing food aid and, and additional support in, in Syria. Yeah, in Syria. Yes, we're in Syria. We're providing a lot of support in Syria. Uh, we were there for winter. We started our winter program there earlier this year, uh, providing you know winter winter clothing and 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 food parcels. But we've always grown it, and IDF has been in Syria for many years. Uh, however, we're trying to also build on that programming. Now we're looking at building shelters for our families that live in that space. Uh, we're also looking at providing an education and emergencies approach, which is essentially providing education support to children that are living in these camps and living in these spaces, because we know that refugee children ha- are five times less likely to go to school. So we're providing school 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 services there and education there. So we we spent some time along the border um, there, but it was it was it was at the climax of of a lot of the challenges between Turkey and Syria that last. Week, uh, so we were forced to evacuate a little sooner. Um, but yeah, the situation there is is is, is not pleasant, and uh, may Allah make it easier for for everyone there. I mean, and and what is the condition literally on the ground? Like like how how do people live? Like how are the camps set up, and and how are they organized? So the camps in northern Syria are overcrowded at the moment. There are way too many people that are going to northern Syria at this time. Uh, and due to the ongoing conflict, it seems as though there's going to be a, a larger push to that region. So at this stage, there is a need for more, uh, for sure, some more protection uh, when looking at tents or shelters or, 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 or constructions to be built for people, because at this stage, there's a lot of people going up there. And, and the- water, sanitation, toilets... Exactly. I was just about to get there. There's that. That only leads to more in the space of of wash. So you, there needs to be the, the wells need to be rehabilitated. More latrines need to be built. So there needs to be a larger infrastructure support program that's given to that region because there is a, a very high influx of people that are going there. Uh, the region is not uh, familiar to having such large numbers of people coming in all at one time, and there there is a big push of people going there. So support services need to be urgent uh, right now. Whether it's the life essentials of food, water, also 
financial protection needs to be at the forefront of that. And, and when recognizing of something of this caliber, uh, it's always important to keep the needs of uh, women and children in mind, because at times like this, they they oftentimes are are either looked at as spoils of this, or oftentimes play the role of caregivers and collect food and water and whatnot. However, take very little for themselves. So it's important to safeguard their rights and provide them with some services. And, and you just mentioned children. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, of the uh, one million new forcibly displaced people, uh, half half of that, so 500,000, are children in yeah. Idlib. Yeah, yeah, and that's uh, I, w- even if you go over to uh, some of the border regions of Turkey and Syria, you pr- predominantly you see a lot of children. A lot of I, I spent some time with uh, a, y- a young boy named Ahmed. Uh, he's eight years old. He's a part of one of our programs, and he was by- he he actually was in Turkey alone, and it's along the border. So you can see from where we were, uh, the Syrian border is right there, so, and you can see the camps on the other side. And and he was there alone. He was in Turkey alone, and and he pro- he's he's one of the beneficiaries of one of our programs, and and. I I had a chance to sit down and, and speak with him and to understand his story a little, and uh, and and he was saying that he doesn't know what happened to his mom. He doesn't know what happened to his father. He's alone, uh, no siblings with him at all. He he made it out alone um, out of Idlib, and, and now he's in Turkey. And uh, thanks to the support that he's getting, uh, he's a, he he has that ability to, to escape his reality uh, while he's in school or while he's at our education centers and getting all the support and food and whatnot. He it allows him to escape that reality just for a little bit. Um, but it just goes to show the levels of a PTSD support, like all the challenges that a lot of these children had to go through to uh, just survive and get to the other side of that border. It's it's uh, uh, it's it's really challenging. And and how and and obviously psychologically, the the the, the you mentioned post traumatic stress disorder and and the stress and the fear and the 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 the, 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 the literally terror that people are in, uncertain as to what's going to happen from day to day. From a psychological standpoint, what do you sense right now just amongst the people? Obviously, uh, it is a dire circumstance, but, but the stories of resilience and, 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 and courage and inspiration... Yeah, I, you you see you see a lot of that, right? You see a lot of courage. You see a lot of resilience. Um, but what's important is that we, as an aid sector, um, and as a, and I should say, as rather as a global community, need to do more to to, to support a lot more children. Sorry through psychosocial support, uh, through mental health support services. Oftentimes, these services are looked at as a luxury, right? Whether it be that or whether it be educational, looked at as a luxury when you're in the uh, emergency space because we oftentimes think about, you know, the life essentials of clean water and sanitation and food and protection, but things are, but, but the elements of psychosocial support and education are so essential and so important to the, to the needs of children because if you just think about the Syrian conflict, right, we're going on close to a decade fairly soon and you, it's looking at a decade of children oftentimes not attending school. They're five times less likely to do so. Um, In addition to the fact that they've lost complete structure in their lives, losing family members or extended family, no homes, and just seeing all of the challenges that they saw, right? All of this war and and, and, and issues, and also now having to seek refuge and travel and come to another region of the world, it's important to provide them with some mental health support and also understand that they can go to somebody, speak to someone, um, and also, you know, express themselves in different ways. One of the programs that we have is a, is a is an arts-based uh, psychosocial program where the children and youth are allowed to come in and draw and create art and use art as a way to a advocate, but also be as using that as a way to express themselves. And therapy. Um, and- and it's therapy, right? And, and, and they've done so, and we've done that through drawing and through music and just different ways of them expressing themselves because we also recognize that it's not comfortable for everyone to just sit down with a psychologist in a room and, 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 and speak. Uh, but there are, there are other ways that we can all express ourselves, right, and, and, and tap into that and also build resiliency and, and, and think of different ways of coping. So it's really important that these are programs that are funded, that are supported by the community at large because they're oftentimes looked at as a luxury and not an essential, but I really do feel they are because those are the elements that help build a stronger future, right? And those are the things that help ensure that a child or a youth can grow into into a stronger adult. And also providing these services to adults are important too. And and even like in the umbrella of healthcare, so we talked about 
uh, the psychological well-being. Now, the actual physical well-being, what are the common illnesses and health issues that, that people are having? And, and how are these healthcare, physical health issues also, in addition to psychological issues, how are they being addressed or are they being addressed? Yeah, so one of the challenges you'll notice is with the Uyghur refugees. When looking at the Uyghur refugees in Turkey, they're not actually considered refugees because they haven't received that status uh, from UNHCR. So they don't get the benefits that uh, that a Syrian refugee would get when they're looking at their health care support services uh, within Turkey. So people like the Uyghur refugees that are now in China, that are, sorry, that are now in Turkey, actually do not receive health care support. Um, and the only way that they're surviving right now is through the food programming that we're we're, we're providing to them, so there is an essential need for healthcare there. Uh, their their conditions and, and their 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 well being can vary across the board, right? Uh, there there are women that say, "Hey, my my child, I, I'm not sure what's wrong, right? It's it's they haven't had they don't have the funds or the ability to kind of get them tested. Uh, so there is a need for a larger healthcare infrastructure program to be provided, and also um, when looking at the border with with Syria and Turkey. And also, just for the Syrians that live in northern Turkey, there's a, there's a tremendous need for healthcare programming. Uh, people have gone, oftentimes, have lived through uh, ongoing uh, mortar attacks and bombings and and all types of things that are happening to them. Right? Uh, children are, are uh, there. There was a family that 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 I heard a story from while I was in the in the field just a few, last week, and and they mentioned that they had to crawl for a very long distance just to pretend uh, that they weren't alive so people wouldn't attack them. Wow. And, and and when you just hear those stories of a mother, a single mother saying that with her children, and, and then you think of just, thank God you guys are alive, but now what are some of the effects of that, right? Like, like where are things at with, you, with your health right? um, and your respiratory? Just just thinking about these things large, largely, there's there's so many challenges from a health care support standpoint that, that, that is needed um, and, and that needs to really be be to be thought through, and I think there needs there there needs to be an angle of an innovative healthcare approach as well. Uh, when thinking about leveraging new technologies, when thinking about uh, spaces space of te- telemedicine and whatnot, that'd be a very good area to start thinking about. How do you leverage new technologies and provide and bring innovation in uh, to the space of humanitarian aid? And we were speaking with uh, Syrian refugees about their experience, and one of them, Shaza, she told us that many people prefer to die than to be wounded and to to carry on life in that situation is part of that maybe in your experience because there is no health care there's no aid for that yeah and you're also looked at as in that time weak right and 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 you're not um and it's, it's very difficult for you and you feel as though you're a burden on every, and on everyone else so it's there's a, a lack of health care and support services leads to people thinking that way or being in that kind of a position and it makes it very challenging. So yeah, very right. So it's 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 you see people just want to give up, right? It's such a challenging time for them that they actually want to give up. And and even with the families, because you'd mentioned the one orphan boy that was Ahmed who's three years old, like a three I have a three year old daughter and I can't imagine her being alone. And to imagine a boy that's three years old alone, not knowing where his mother and father are. And there are many stories like that. Sometimes, you know, these even our last interview, uh, Shaza's cousin was 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 killed in in in, in um, a tank attack. And and these are just human beings living normal lives and they just happen to be in the crossfire and they get wounded or killed and and their families suffer. And so how do you keep your attitude up when you see this type of uh, uh, human tragedy and and all the difficulties? What what keeps you going? What keeps you saying, you know what, uh, I I see this kind of carnage, but what what keeps your psychological attitude up? Especially given the fact that you're the program director of IVRF, so you have to, you know, keep a brace of all the issues around the world. Mm-hmm. I uh, honestly, I would say it's it's just I'm just so lucky, and we're all just so lucky, uh, alhamdulillah, to be on this side of the world, right? Uh, to to think of the benefits that I don't have to wake up every morning and and think about what I'm going to eat, or the fact that my that I have clean access to clean water, or the fact that my family has somewhere to sleep and stay, and uh, and and to think of to think that the fact that I actually have the ability to 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 move from from my home to work, and then. Be 
maybe back to take uh, one of my siblings to their sports game and to have to have that to also be able to kind of surf the web and use the internet and 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 learn and read and and have and and be able to kind of practice my religion openly like there's so much benefits that 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 I have and that my community has and my friends have and my family and everyone around me and also my team here at IDF we 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 have so much benefits and and freedom all these luxuries that we take for granted all these uh, uh these the benefits of being in the first world and that we all take for granted is what keeps me motivated because when I go to the field and I see the, those very same basic things that I just mentioned having access to, people there do not have, right? Whether I'm in Somalia or whether it's in Bangladesh or even in go, going closer to, uh, to Canada, like the Guyana, and you see that some people don't have these same things is what keeps me going because I say, A, it's uh, oftentimes it's a luck of the draw in terms of where, where you're from and where you're born and, 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 and where you are, but it, it really comes down to how do you provide more services and aid and support for those around the world so that they that their burdens are are, are, are reduced and, and that's what it is and that's what keeps me motivated and when I hear the stories of a young boy who's three years old uh, that doesn't have a family and he still wakes up every single day because he thinks he can still do more and when I'm in the field and I and I see like a young girl who says hey well thank you so much for, for the training that you guys provided and funded because now I have the ability to manage my own business and I can start you know my own catering program it's, it's all these stories get you motivated and you're like you want to do more and it's and it's, I, I've instilled that within my team and my team does that for me and they share stories of the different projects they manage from around the world when they travel and, and they oftentimes come back with really supportive stories like uh, one of our program managers Farouk was in, was in Lebanon uh, about a year ago, and he came back with a story uh, how IDF built a really large education center there for children, and that's used year over year over year. And and these are the things that keep me motivated and keep me going. But it really is just a comparison of life when I just see how easy it is here um, for all of us to survive, and and how challenging it is there. And how do I kind of you know ensure that those services are provided? And also when thinking about here in Canada, that it's not easy for a lot of people here too. So a lot of our programming does uh, provide support here to Canadians. And, and I think about that too. And 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 amazingly, like you're saying, from the the point of gratitude, being grateful for what we have here, and being grateful to see on the ground the stories of resilience, the stories of of, of impact, and and how uh, IDRF's work has, has has benefited people's lives. So I think that's also enriching and gratifying. Very much so. Very much so. And it's like when you're able to connect stories from the field back here at home um, and you're able to just see that and see see that growth and see that resilience being built um, and seeing women from like rural Thar Parker uh, who had very uh, little access to education support services to now being full-fledged midwives providing you know support and, and health care services to the entire communities or when you're in like Thar, uh, on the Thar Desert and, 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 and you built water wells for people and, and that benefit is there and there, we're in Gaza trucking water to schools and, and children are putting on an article exhibit here in Toronto from Gaza. It was like, we've done such, uh, cre- we've thought of different creative ways of showcasing and sharing stories, but we are at the heart of our work. It's really about just empowering people uh, to, to live a wholesome and, and beautiful life. And how do you work with the other aid agencies like UNHCR and the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, the, the Blue Crescent? How do you work with other aid agencies? So there's IDRF and the resources IDRF brings, but there are also other uh, aid agencies that are uh, global aid agencies. How, how do you work with them? And then there's localized aid agencies that don't necessarily exist outside of uh, the specific country you're in. So how do you how do you how do you navigate? How do you have your personnel situated to, to, to get the most impact? Mm-hmm. Great question. So there's, there are two parts to that answer. So when looking at it from the multilateral space of the larger aid agencies, a lot of us work together in terms of from coordinating from a coordination standpoint. So uh, what that essentially is is when looking at some of the different clusters when you're at some of the different emergencies. A good example is maybe like the Rohingya crisis, right? There was a, a shelter cluster that is made that is that is essentially. Uh, uh, done by UNHCR, and they bring together all of the different agencies working on shelter. So we all kind of get together in meetings, uh, on, and this is in the field I, I'm, I'm mentioning, and we're in the field, we all meet together and coordinate all of our efforts. Okay, I'm building homes here, maybe you shouldn't build in this camp, I'll build over here, how are you going to do it? Or also thinking about cash programming, are we going to be giving out cash, what's your amount, how do we kind of all work with work with one another to ensure that you know all, the, all of the beneficiaries are met? So a lot of coordination happens, especially when in, when in the space of emergencies. When all also, another time we oftentimes collaborate would be information sharing. 
also of IDRF, we have like a strong access into spaces like such as Somalia. If we're in South Central Somalia, we're doing projects, we're doing a lot of we're doing a lot of programming. We'll share a lot of our data and a lot of a lot of the information on the ground with some of the larger agencies, just so that they know, and the aid agencies will also share with us. So there's like a lot of that information sharing from a, whether it's a, a disaster or if anything is going on, or also in terms of some success stories from programming, just so we can also maybe leverage that and, and, and implement there. So from from with the international space, that's how we kind of coordinate. Uh, there's always room for improvement for us to kind of work together more and, and think of ways of collaborating and, and making things a little more efficient. But right now, it really happens when thinking about emergencies and setting up different clusters to do so, and also the sharing of information during natural disasters or also successes of programs. Then the other side of that is how IDF actually works. And the way we do our programming is through, it's called, it's essentially called a localized approach. And what we do is across the world, um, IDRF works with local partners, local registered charities to implement the work that we do. So what we do is we provide the funding to a local charity, let's say, for example, in Somalia, to actually implement the work for IDRF. However, what IDRF does is we provide the direction, the control, the monitoring and evaluation, the capacity building. So we're really there to manage that partner, implement the work. So they become an extension of our team contractually. Um, and all as under the Canadian Revenue Agency, all direction, all control and all oversight must be provided from the headquarter charity, which is IDRF. So our team, our program managers, provide detailed oversight, reporting, financial oversight, receding, uh, monitoring and evaluation, ensuring that the capacities are built for that local team, giving them training, ensuring that they're meeting the needs of beneficiaries, making sure that it's a bottom-up approach, that we're conducting in-depth quantitative and qualitative analysis, um, and that we're really looking at our data and seeing what our top-line find- findings are and how we're mitigating and changing it, and how we're really thinking about a pragmatic way of supporting those in need. And we do so across the world in every country we work in. So we have local partners that we work with. And that way, and the reason why we work through that is because, A, it's the best approach to international development because you A, are supporting your local community. You're supporting that local economy by hiring locals there. You're, pro- you're procuring food and you're supporting that all the way through. So the economy is being supported. But you're also building capacities of those individuals. Because if the IDRF were to ever uh, not have funding to go into Somalia anymore and has to shift to, let's say, Uganda or has to shift to Kenya, now those partners on the ground have the capacity to solicit funding and get funding from other organizations around the world. They now have a built website. They now know how to report. They now know how to financial report. They now know the importance of monitoring and evaluation. They now know how to support individuals, right? They know how to take a gender approach to things. So it's building their capacity and helping them so in the event that IDF isn't there, they can also be supported in the long term. And also, we're not coming in saying, hey, this is the Canadian way of doing things and waving our flag. We're coming in saying, hey, let's work together on this. You're on the ground. Tell us exactly what you need and how can we collaborate to make things uh, the, the most efficient and the most helpful to those in need. And and obviously, you have to also work with governments. So in, in yeah. the 45 countries that, that uh, IDRF has operated in, working with the local Ministry of Health and, and the government officials, uh, how do you typically navigate that? So working with governments for us, uh, thankfully, has been has been quite smooth. So all of our local partners uh, oftentimes have good relationships with governments, uh, or at least have a, enough, a good enough relationship with the government to allow us to do the work that we do. So uh, we oftentimes do go, we have to meet with governors, or we have to meet with different government officials, different NGO affairs bureaus, and just to kind of let them know that, hey, this is the work that we're doing. Uh, we are nonpartisan. We're not here uh, to do anything beyond support people in need, and we just want that support. To, uh, be, and, and what we really want is uh, access. It's not really even support. It's more so access uh, to do that. And, and if the government supports us, that's even better. And we've never had a situation around the world where a government was against any of the, our, our, our efforts because they recognize how we operate, right? It's not IDRF walking through the door. It's IDRF uh, in support of a local partner walking through the door and saying, hey, this is what we want to do here on the ground to support whether it's the host community, whether it's the refugees, or whether it's just different IDPs broadly. It's really uh, collaborating with governments in that sense and also thinking about what the needs of those governments are. So an example of that is, is AFID, um, and they work closely in the space. Uh, they, they're, they're the coordinating body uh, along the Syrian-Turkish border, and we met with them in November, and one of their challenges was saying, hey, in northern Syria, there are a lot of people moving uh, to the north and because of the challenges happening in southern Syria. And and you see that today, in the last few weeks, what's happening in Idlib. So this is in November. And, and we met with him and, and we, we spoke in detail about what some of the services that IDF could provide are. And he said, hey, he gave us a full-up presentation and went through each slide 
talking about the need for winter clothing and talking about the need for tarps over homes and all, and 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 uh food parcels so we went back we did our we continued to do our research and worked with our local team on the ground there and continued to do that but that's a key example of a government body saying hey well these are some of the issues and here's here's some of the gaps we have in funding can a charity jump in and support some of the people in need and and we we ended up doing that and and, and that's been a pillar of our winter programming there and 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 uh, you said something very critical. It's like to let the governments know that we're not political. There's you know obviously people are very passionate about their political issues of what a government is doing or not doing and trying to do the blame game. But at the end of the day, to really meaningfully do something on the ground and get it done, um, uh, the approach of obviously uh, nonpartisan. We're we're just doing the work uh, however we're going to do it with the support of the government and and to really uh, in my view to to do the most effective humanitarian work is to, is to work with the government work with the locals to to make it uh, more effective and and to be as nonpartisan non-political and and just say hey we're here to help how can we help let's work together exactly that's that's the best approach to take. Uh, it's to really put politics aside and to say, hey, how do we come together to help one another? How do we come together to just support people? Because uh, regardless of what, what your political views are, regardless of what you are, who you are, at the end of the day, there are people in need. There are children suffering. There are mothers that cannot receive support, and and we need and we need to get to them. And we need to get to them now, um, and we need to also end cycles of, of lifelong poverty, of lifelong displacement. Uh, and that is why we are here. So let's support one another in getting that done. And uh, you mentioned something earlier on, which I was very surprised about, about the Uyghur refugees from China coming yeah. to Turkey. That's a big distance. And yeah. and and so, like, obviously, in, in the work that you're doing, you're, you're abreast of all the humanitarian crises for the most part around the world. And the Uyghur crisis in China and, and, and that part of the world, how did these uh, refugees find their way to Turkey? And why did they come to Turkey when there are other countries nearby uh, China? So Turkey has always had uh, uh, a great history of welcoming a, of, of refugees all around the world, and 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 that's Turkey as as you as we all now know has millions of Syrian refugees that live within within their country. The the interesting piece though is that the Uyghur Uyghur uh, individuals and, and, and people are are all, uh, have a lot of ethnic uh, connections to Turkey and. And, and and I don't have my history exactly correct on this stance, but I believe it um, there through the silk trade um, there was a lot of connections there, and that's where a lot of Uyghurs uh, went over to East Turkestan, or they came from East Turkestan over to Turkey. But vice, regardless, that's the trail of which there there's been that connection. So a lot of Uyghurs are actually ethnically are Turkish people, um, and they do speak a very similar language, and 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 they all sometimes really understand each other. A lot of the food is very similar as well, and and. The weaker people live in a in in the part uh, of Asia called East Turkestan. So there's a lot of that synergies and a lot of connections between uh, Turkey and 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 the Uyghur people. They essentially are uh, from the same ethnic uh, background, so they have a lot of that connection there. And what's amazing about Turkey itself uh, being home to four million refugees, it's it's a lot of resources, a lot of coordination, a lot of personnel. So so the 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 brunt of all of this, it seems like the the Turkey government is is really taking a lot of responsibility to to really try and care for the people as best as they can. It's it's not a uh, it's not an easy task. To, it's literally four million people is the population of some countries, and so that that's that's a, a lot of people. And in addition to that, it's not just the Syria Turkey border, but but again, how many Uyghur refugees are there that that are currently in Turkey? Numbers no. wise. There are roughly about um, since the '40s. There are roughly about a hundred thousand that are there, um, and since about 2014, there's uh, we're, we're looking at about north of 30,000 that are that are in Turkey. Um, the challenge, though, again, that they face is um, that the they're not considered. Yeah, the status. They're not actually considered refugees, um, and unless that they are deemed a refugee by uh, the UNHCR and are given, you know, refugee status, uh, then they can't. Then get Turkey has something essentially more like uh, there's a Turkish name for it, but they have there's a name called a guest. Uh, 
permit in a sense, and and you can use that guest to be to receive you know um, healthcare services or, or, or whatnot and, 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 and any social assistance. But you actually can't get that right now if you're a Uyghur because you're not considered a refugee. So as much as the Turks uh, want to support um, the Uyghurs that are in country, they're very limited. However, they are doing amazing work in providing them with anything that they can, whether it's nutrition or protection services. Um, and that's where we as a, as a charity have jumped in to say, hey, okay, well, what can we do? And we've been providing them with food aid and we hope to provide them with the medical uh, support because that's something that they've uh, a lot of the mothers told me firsthand that they're in need of. And and obviously the, the challenges are enormous and the resources uh, are needed more than ever. Um, in terms of the resources for IDRF, are they primarily coming from Canada or do you have support from other countries as well? All of our all of our support for IDRF is always coming from Canada. It's coming from individuals, uh, oh, amazing Canadians that that have honestly opened up their hearts uh, and their wallets to IDRF and um, been supporting us. So all of our support comes from only in Canada, and uh, through that support, we've been able to help uh, more than half a million people this year, and we hope to grow that. And and even the Canadian government, I'm sure, with some of the international granting programs. Yeah, so the Canadian government has supported IDRF uh, for many, many, many years. Um, at this at this current moment, we're not uh, being funded by the Canadian government, but we're always looking at ways of building that relationship some more to cultivate it. And Nabil, you were saying uh, IDRF had helped f- half a million people this year. Is that projected for 2020 or up till today in 2020? So no, that that actually goes up until June of 2019. We helped 650,000 people, okay. um, and our biggest impact being in food security, where we helped over 250,000 people, followed by uh, healthcare, where we helped over 160,000 people, and water, where we helped uh, over 140,000. So we helped over 650,000 people in uh, by as of June 2019. So uh, we'll have our latest uh, updated impact numbers uh, in June of, of this year, 2020. And and it, it, uh, just to share with you um, how um, personally I got involved in this was the Rohingya crisis of 2017 was was such a, a, a tragic event and and now uh, even with my kids at night we, we 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 do our prayers and then what we try and do is uh, mention each country and then it's like I'm trying to. So there's so many countries that we we kind of do the prayers for for all the people their their well being their, their their families their health their safety their security and and then I'm just trying to count off all the countries and I'm like I'm, there, there's just so many countries where there's humanitarian crises we've got Yemen we've got uh, uh, Palestine we've got uh, Africa Sudan Somalia we've got uh, obviously the the, the 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 Uyghur crisis. There, there's so many crises around the world, even the Mexico border, um, and and it just seems like uh, from the UN uh, statistics, currently there's 70 million refugees in the world today, and it's projected in about nine years by 20 uh, 2029 2030 is that the refugee crisis will reach 300 million people, which is a huge amount of people. And already, uh, from what I'm gathering from our conversation, many refugee uh, aid agencies are stretched to the limit of the resources. And now, even with 70 million refugees currently, and with with the issue growing to uh, three times, four times uh, the, the humanitarian crisis, looking forward in your mind, because... There's a lot of work that needs to be done. What are strategies or what have you seen in your personal experience and from the institution of IDRF? What are ways to help the most amount of people in, in, in the most effective way? There are many ways. There are many ways. But I think if we start off at a very high level, if when looking at the 70 million people that are that are displaced uh, right now, whether they're IDPs or refugees, it's also important to recognize that over 80% of those 70 million people are in uh, the developing countries of the world. Uh, they're in countries such as uh, Lebanon and in Jordan and and in places like Iraq and and then whatnot. So, like if you really think about where the refugees the pockets are, they're in the developing countries. They're really not in some of the in, in the G8 or or nations such as that, right? And, and that's really important to note because countries uh, that are developing already have challenges themselves, right? When you think of places uh, such as Kenya and Ethiopia and Uganda, these are all countries that are all developing and working on 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 who they are, and also Lebanon, for example, 
are working on their identity and trying to build their, their, their nation, but they have also taken in millions of refugees. And that's because, of course, of proximity, right? It's refugee by proximity in a sense they, they take them in because they're closest. For example, Bangladesh was next door to Myanmar, and that's how it works. So it's oftentimes by, by, by proxy. Um, however, there needs to be a global push uh, to support these nations that are receiving these refugees. Uh, for example, uh, Jordan or Lebanon, right? And they, they should be receiving a lot more financial financial assistance, uh, whether it be from the G8 or whether it be from the UN or some of the different agencies that are, are working on this, um, and provide a lot more funding and support, or even from the EU or whoever it may be, find financial assistance to these nations so that they can also um, continue to develop but also continue to be supportive of this. Turkey is a good example of that. It took in 4 million Syrian refugees, but oftentimes a lot of the pledges and a lot of the funding that they're supposed to receive goes unfulfilled. So. It's A, ensuring that anything that's pledged is fulfilled, but B, making sure that they actually do get funding uh, when they do take in a lot of refugees because they can always use that because these nations are also growing themselves. The other thing that I think is really important is to provide a lot more education and vocational skills training to refugees and to also start thinking about the fact that refugees, when they do come to nations, oftentimes provide great support to that economy, that they are very beneficial, that they're giving, and they're, they're supportive in the building of the economy in the country that they do come to. Uh, and we've seen that often with uh, the Syrian refugees that have come to Canada and all, all of the refugees that have come before them to Canada. And it's important to understand and to use that as, as a way of, of, of championing that globally so that they can, A, when they do come to this country or any country around the world, have access to education, have access to vocational skills training, have, get some upskilling or whatever they need, um, or allow them to get integrated into the society very easily so that they can continue to get on their feet uh, and are supported. So I think integration is really key, and you can do that through education and support services. But I think to ensure that that education is meaningful, that it's beneficial, it needs to start early. And it needs to start in the refugee camps that these people live in. So if you look at the, um, the Dadaab camp in Kenya, there are people there that have gone to that camp in the early 90s. And there are families uh, now that have had children there, and their children have had children there. And these new parents now have never gone to school, have zero skills, uh, are not literate, and are now started, and they're living in this life. And it's and, and, and they're just going over, and this is how it's going to be. And there needs to be an end to that cycle there, right? There needs Education needs to be incorporated within that. Vocational skills training need to be incorporated within that. And there needs to be ways of, of, of income-generating opportunities and support services to provide it to people because oftentimes now, if you looked at, I believe it was in 1995, the average life cycle of someone being displaced uh, was nine years. Uh, now that's doubled. We're looking mm-hmm. at nearly 20 years, right? So if, if you, that, there's something clearly wrong there. So if you're not going to be displaced for 20 years, that's 20 years of you not working, 20 years of you not getting an education and living in this space, no psychosocial support, no, uh, no, no way of you providing income for yourself. And then if you're then brought into, let's say, uh, Europe or in Canada or anywhere else, that it's going to be a lot more challenging for you to kind of get on your feet. So it's providing those services to these people, to these individuals well on, and, and also ensuring that they have that also in Canada or any country that they go to. And you, you, you mentioned a term earlier on, IDP, which yeah. uh, translates to internally displaced uh, persons. And, yeah. and, and that would be in reference to, let's say, Yemen or Iraq, where people are actually from the country. They haven't actually left their borders, but they're internally displaced within their country. Maybe explain uh, the work that you're doing with internally displaced persons, and maybe let's let's dial it to specifically to Yemen and, and Iraq and other places of internally displaced people. Yeah, so we do a lot of our work when thinking about IDPs around the world. So as you mentioned, they're, inter- they're internally displaced persons, but IDPs uh, make up a significant number of, of of refugees around the world, right? So they're, we're looking at close to about 14 million of them that are, that are displaced, and there's like I think the stat is about 40,000 or 35,000 uh, are, are newly displaced every day, um, and if that which is a staggering amount of people. Yeah. So these are people, yes, that are within their wow. country's borders. Sorry? Wow, it's just horrible. It's horrible. Yeah, it's, it's insane. And if you look at... Um, it's the way it oftentimes works, it's a good example is Somalia, where there's a lot of conflict going on, whether it's tribal warfare, whether it's terrorism, or any other challenges happening. Or Climate even that, change. 
climate change is another big one, and and people are leaving their pastoral lives or leaving their lives in villages or, or communities and going to different parts or larger hubs or larger cities within the country to receive some aid or services or new opportunities. And 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 as you mentioned, there climate change is a huge mem- uh, reason for why people are oftentimes being displaced. And right now, climate change is not a reason why somebody a can be considered a refugee or an asylum seeker through that sense. However, a res- the results of that can lead to you becoming a refugee. So there are people that are within countries that are moving um, and they're staying within their boundaries, but then recognizing, okay, well, you now have individuals that are from another part of the country in another village or in another community or in one of the larger cities or the capital city. And um, of course, there's going to be changes to that community now. Um, and the host community, of course, is not going to like uh, giving up land or giving up space and, and having this influx, right? And what that's going to do to their own uh, socioeconomic uh, setup and, and, and their lives, right? So a lot of IDPs are the work that we IDF support. So we provide them with food and water educational support services, and we do that a lot in Somalia, and Yemen has been a key place in which we support a lot of IDPs and where we thought of a a, a new way of of bridging a lot of our work, right? I always talk about the nexus approach of bridging development and sustainable uh, development and humanitarian efforts, and in Yemen is a good example where we were able to do so, where we were working right now with... um, a large number of IDPs uh, in, in southern Yemen, and the challenge that a lot of these IDPs are facing was they weren't they're receiving food aid, and and but a lot of these IDPs used to be farmers and 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 work uh, off of their crops and their land. So what we did is we built a lot of water wells in the region, and those water wells now irrigate, and through we built a system where they irrigate nearby farmland for them. So now they're able to grow their own produce and 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 farmland right right there, and and they 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 have their harvests and. It works out well. They are now able to sell those produce, and we'll buy those produce off of them, inshallah, to to provide food aid to other people on the ground. So we want to kind of create cycles of that and abilities for people to have, you know, grow some income in country and and get some stability. But IDPs are people that, yeah, don't get a chance to leave their country and are stuck within it and and are in dire need of support. And in many cases, it's much more dangerous, especially if it's in a war zone. Very much so, or oftentimes, yeah, you're leaving uh, if there's any clan warfare or things like that happening and you're stuck within that space, it's it's, it's where do you go? Uh, you can't leave that country, you're stuck within it, and that's what's happening in Syria right now. Northern Syria has a significant number of IDPs that are there, and uh, then and the future of, the, of their lives is, is, is honestly is in question right now. And and the numbers are staggering. Like, uh, just the statistics here, we're looking at 4.3 million people forced to leave their homes in Yemen, and 80% of uh, the population, 24 million people, are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. So these are numbers like it's... it's And actually, part of this uh, refugee podcast... Uh, to be able to tell the stories of the people because I think when we just see statistics like the numbers like 24 million people it, it, it just becomes statistics and what what our objective is is to hear the stories from people like you that have physically been there talk to the people and actually people that were refugees to tell their individualized personal stories because that's the way I think people can connect because as you said in Canada we are uh uh, blessed to, to live in this country and, and we're privileged and we have a lot of uh, benefits and, 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 and a great lifestyle uh, but but a lot of people around the world don't have what we have and, and to really hear those stories and the 24 million people that are in dire need of humanitarian assistance more or less means food clothing, yeah. shelter, clean water, sanitation safety for their families like these are things we take for granted but, uh, but, but this is a daily uh, issue and in one of the interviews we did with uh, uh, a girl from Syria was safety, the feeling of being safe, like something that we don't even think about in Canada, but the 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 the, the concept of feeling safe. And so, so I, I really commend the work that you guys are doing and just getting to Yemen with the work that we did uh, just with with the, the the fundraiser we did last year. But just growing into that, like you're saying, what are the other on the ground impact uh, in addition to the, the, the water wells that you'd mentioned earlier? What are the on the ground impacts you're able to do uh, throughout your work in Yemen? Yeah, so right now in Yemen, we're looking at a few different initiatives, one of them uh, being a recycling program. Yemen has a huge challenge of uh, just large, just, just a lot of 
garbage uh, just all across major cities and roadways, and, which is really contaminating the water, leading to waterborne illnesses such as cholera and, and typhoid and whatnot being a result of that. And uh, what we want to do is limit uh, the potential for any waterborne uh, diseases and any illnesses coming from that. So we, we've been, uh, we're going to be starting a project where we will be hiring local uh, people in, in, in Yemen uh, to use tuk-tuks, which are small mobile uh, vehicles that are oftentimes either on bikes or on motorized bikes, and uh, to collect garbage um, and recycle them. And then once it's recycled, and, and we'd be paying them to do so, essentially to start cleaning up some of uh, the region and, and, and some of the larger cities so that people, uh, their, their water sources won't be contaminated so much anymore. And then we'll also continue to invest in wells and build some wells provide food aid, but one of the, the, the key things that we're going to be doing in Yemen in Somalia, in Palestine, in Syria, um, is a new initiative that IDRF will be launching, and in Bangladesh as well for the Rohingya refugees. It's going to be an education in emergencies. And what this education and emergency program is going to be is across every country. It's going to obviously be localized uh, to meet the needs of the local community in each country, but it's a broad education and emergency pro initiative where every one of these countries that I named have a large number of whether it's IDPs or refugees and their global and their global emergencies. But we want to ensure that they're not only just receiving the global aid that we're giving them from an emergency lens, but we're providing them with long-term assistance. So we want to use education to be that 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 would be that that driver, and uh, we're going to use uh, whether it's the basics of education, such as maths and sciences, and, and of course language courses. But we want to incorporate psychosocial support to be a pillar of that, um, and any other additional support services, or even looking at tech being incorporated in it. So it's going to be. Uh, a large initiative that we're going to be launching uh, later this year, but it's going to be called Education and Emergencies, and Yemen's going to be one of the countries we do that in, and Somalia, Bangladesh, Syria. Yeah, it's so important. Uh, even just the number Tark brought up, 4.3 million people. I looked more into it, and of those, 76% are women and children, and 27% are below the age of 18. So you can see an almost the majority of people are women and children. And if 30% of 4 million people are, are under 18, what what's their future like? Because because if you don't impact them today with positive goals or positive opportunities, it'll just be a generational problem, right? Which you see in Kenya, as you said, which you see in other parts of the world. So t- tell us a little bit more about the initiative for education and, and how technology can help, uh, you know, solve this problem. So that so this is where it essentially came from was that it's we were going into all of these refugee camps, we were providing these services and these aid, and, but we knew that hey, this is not as as many times as you see reports of oh, okay, well this is a sudden onset emergency or this thing will be shifted in the next few years or it's going to be a year long thing. We knew that the working refugees are not leaving Bangladesh for a decade, and we knew that uh, those who have gone to Lebanon or the Syrian refugees like this is this is going on and this is growing and just more and more people are being displaced now. More than ever. So it's a matter of understanding that, hey, well, if the cycle of you being displaced is now on average 20 years, what does that look like? And then what does your future hold? And then what do these people do? So we wanted to really think of a way of providing services to them so that they're just not um, always dependent on, on something, but they're all, but that, and it's not to say that education will, will, will limit that dependence, or it's not to say that because we provide education to refugee camps, people will not need anything anymore. There, there still will be a need, but it's now you're saying that, hey, well, you're educating somebody, you're providing them with services and, and, and educational support to really tap into some of their potential. And, and, opportunities. and we, we, we talked about technology and, and also how we connected previously is our technology company that's focused on, on telemedicine solutions. Yeah. And, and by leveraging uh, technology, uh, uh, teleconferencing, telemedicine, and, and secure data services to ensure electronic medical records and health records are accessible 24-7 uh, to refugees and doctors worldwide. So to leverage technology, because there's only so many doctors in the world today, and, oh, yeah. and for them to, to go to Yemen or uh, the camps uh, on the bangladesh Myanmar border with, uh, with, uh, for the Rohingya refugees or the Syria-Turkey border, it, it takes a certain... Uh, stamina and strength and, and, and courage to physically go to these places. But with telemedicine, you can do uh, consultations with doctors overseas and even within that own the country itself uh, without the doctor physically having to be there through teleconferencing and telemedicine. And then what you mentioned about psycho uh, therapy and, and helping with the psychological aspect and well-being. So in a similar way, that can be provided through these technological capabilities and for the future 
for something to be sustainable long term and leveraging technology to help millions of people um, in our collaboration and our discussion is how we can carry that forward and help the most amount of people and have the most amount of impact using technology. Very much. I, I agree with you 100%. I think technology has and will be a force for the future. And I think uh, the the efficiencies of the aid sector and the efficiencies of international development lie within technology. And I say that because when looking at the refugee camps that we were just in, uh, you see how technology can really help enhance, A, the paperwork process, or B, as you mentioned, just having doctors. There are amazing, amazing doctors all around the world who would love to be in these refugee camps. However, they just can't because their schedules don't permit or just they have other challenges that limit their ability from getting there. This telemedicine can provide an opportunity for all these doctors to support because the doctors that are on the ground now are overstretched. Uh, there is way too much of a need, and there's so little. Uh, there's a very few number of doctors that can actually provide the support that they need. And so having that telemedicine support services there is essential. But then even if you look at ways of just documenting uh, the history or also just even if we want to think about reporting mechanisms and setting up the right reporting systems and infrastructure uh, for women that have had that, that have had cases of sexual assault or any uh, all other forms of assault against them or just even cases of human trafficking, things of that nature, if we want to set up really strong reporting infrastructures and systems in place, technology is going to be the heart line, the lifeline to that. Um, and even looking at education, right, setting up digital platforms for children to learn, uh, whether it be through tablets. And we see here, uh, right, in the global north, how we use technology in all of our classrooms for children now. So how can why, why not bring that into some of the spaces where children could use that, right? Yeah, and, 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 and even... Uh Again, the the uh, the aspect of leveraging all the technological advancements at, at the moment in our previous discussions and with other aid agencies like Doctors Without Borders, as an example, when we spoke to them, their missions come, uh, they do their work, and by and large, those doctors may never see those patients ever again. It's kind of like, uh, uh, and then they when they do see them, they may not necessarily have all the medical history to refer to like we do in, in, in North America where there's a medical history that can be referred to. And so by having this system in place, that continuity of healthcare over the long term is, is there with technology. And then the, the other thing about family separation and through biometric verification to ensure that families don't get separated like the boy you mentioned earlier, Ahmed, um, by having uh, people that, you know, they don't have their ID. They don't, they've lost everything. But by having these technologies in place, if they're onboarded by the aid agencies with their biometrics, meaning let's say an iris scan, thumbprint, facial recognition, as a way to connect them with their family members. So in the event of possible separation, there's a way to reconnect again. So, and then the other key thing is differentiating who is who, because a, a lot of times if there's like a, a comment was made that there's 2000 Muhammad's in a, in a refugee camp, how do you determine which file is whose? <laughs> so, so by technology, Technology and through biometric uh, uh, verification, there's multiple efficiencies that can be made. And then over the long term, uh, machine learning and AI to see patterns of how inventory control, supply chain management, uh, logistical support, how all of these things can be more efficient, where the aid agency dollar can go a lot more further and, and agencies and groups and philanthropic organizations that want help will know exactly which areas that they need to to focus their 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 funding in for the most impact. Indeed. Indeed. I couldn't agree with you more. And one interesting area that Tark was talking about was using uh, machine learning to look for patterns. And one of the the most important things is the the health of refugees. So if there's a communicable disease, like say the in the news now the coronavirus, so how can uh, patterns of of refugee migration be measured, be mapped, and and the best care be provided to protect them and to protect everyone else, um, especially with with because there are there are a large population that's always on the move, right? So how do you predict where they're going, where they can best be you know protected, where they're coming from? So a lot of this is is being put into these algorithms. Exactly, and I really do think that that's that's where the, that's where we can be the most efficient, and that's where our our future really is um, is, is leading us is really leveraging technology to enhance our efficiencies. Because if we look at it, as much as we can look at the impact of the work that we're doing around the world and speak to the, the hundreds of thousands of people that we're helping, the millions of people that are getting support from all the different agencies put together, there are 
there are still more people becoming more displaced, and there are still the, uh, more people that are in need, and that needs to change. And we need to be able to leverage technology to do that and help our human powers in doing so. That way, we, I mean, it's not like AI is going to take away jobs from us in the sense of, of, of how we do the work, but rather it's going to be complementary, right? Mm-hmm. So we'll still use our ability to think, to think critically and emotional intelligence and all of those angles that humans have, but technology will be bringing in pieces to our work that's going to be complementary and supportive. And I really think that's where our most efficiencies lie and that's where our biggest impact will be when you look at the healthcare sector, but broadly um, the international development sector. And, and you know, we've discussed so much now and there's so much to talk about. Like there's Rohingya, which is one area we haven't really talked too much about. There's Sudan and there's so many countries. And Iraq. And, and, and the, in respect of your time, um, I know we could speak for hours and hours and hours about each specific place. Now, um, if we can, we can uh, let's say have a part two and continue, yeah. or or if if you have uh, the time, we can we can talk about Rohingya. It is a passion of mine uh, because that's really uh, just to share with you a personal story. I, I I saw the pictures that went around in 2017, and and a lot uh, a lot of the horrific pictures that I saw in uh, was a woman who actually looked like a, a, a cousin of mine. Um, just wearing the traditional clothing and her legs were blown off and I was so it just hit my heart uh, looking at that image the look in her face of 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 I can't believe this happened to me and 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 just just recognize uh, trying to to absorb the shock of losing her legs just a normal person that that looked like a a family member and I, I just that image has haunted me till this day and and for Rohingya right now, what is the status after all this time uh, since 2017? And there's about a million Rohingya refugees on the Bangladesh border. What's happening right now with the Rohingya? So there has been efforts of repatriation, which, um, uh, honestly speaking, are, are not enough. And, and there needs to be uh, large-scale challenges that, that, that need to be addressed, uh, both within the Myanmar side um, and and, and uh, I definitely do commend Bangladesh for all of their efforts in taking in over a million of Rohingya refugees and providing them uh, with a space to be and, and, and whatnot. But I think what's really important for them right now is the long-term education and long-term support. So what's, the thing about the challenge with looking at the refugees in the Rohingya refugees is that our 60% of them are children. 60% of them are under the age of 18. And oftentimes, they're unaccompanied minors. When I was there myself, I met a young girl. Um, I, she, it was a young girl. She, I believe at the time, was maybe eight or nine years old. Now she would have been, but uh, maybe 11 or, or so or 12. And, um, and with, 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 what's sad about that is she was carrying a newborn baby with her. The baby could not have been more than more than eight or nine months old, and she was carrying this baby, but this was not her sibling or anything like that. This was a baby that she found on her way from Myanmar to Bangladesh. She had this baby with her, so now she is um, she's a preteen who's a caregiver to a child, and they both have nothing to eat, and she's carrying this baby walking around the camp, and she was following our group as we met, to, as we walked around Taknaf to meet different uh, families, and she was just following us with this baby, and, and of course she wanted money and support from us, and, and it was just so surprising and shocking for me to see a young girl take on such responsibility, and when we asked her, like, you know, who's this baby and what's this about? And she said, yeah, I just picked up the baby on my way because his parents got killed. And that was so shocking. And till this day, she, and I don't know if she's still there on the ground taking care of him, but those are just the kind of stories that stay in my mind. So a lot of the, t- a lot of the people there among us are children, and that's why education and support for them is so important because it's a whole new generation. It's a generation that has to live with this PTSD, that has to live with this trauma, that doesn't have any services, doesn't have the foundation, does not have a family, then what do they do, right? It's already been three years, so now what are we doing, right? What happens from here on out? It's not like they're going to go anywhere for the next five to six years. So what does that look like? I and mean, even if they go back to Myanmar, then what? That there's no home, everything got burned down, um, you know, there's no family there for them, then what, right? So it's 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 really living in this life of ambiguity and in limbo. And then if you think about it, like these oftentimes a lot of them are young girls and women 
given and and the fact that you know that it's heightened uh you know the risks are heightened during these kind of times of just various forms of assault and trafficking it becomes even more challenging and just for children across the board so um i definitely do commend bangladesh for everything that they did for taking in the million people but now it's about what do we do to integrate yeah, especially given their limited resources they themselves yeah. yeah yeah exactly so what does it look like now moving forward right and and in terms of you brought up a, a very uh uh tragic uh, uh, topic, which is uh, human trafficking and sexual assault and sexual trafficking. Now, these vulnerable populations in, in Myanmar and in other countries, um, what's the work being done to try and help prevent uh, human trafficking and, and, and sex trafficking? So, uh, this is not an area that, that IDRF works in directly, but what we, what we have as a sector is a lot more... Um, uh, in a sense, reporting and response uh, set, set up so people, if there are if there are cases of this and if there are reports that there are ways and metrics in which people can kind of use uh, to, to to set up the right reports and actually you know report adequately as as needed. Um, there needs to be more. Though this is a topic and an area that needs to be addressed and and it needs to be targeted more from a lot more agencies around the world. However, getting into this line of work is oftentimes uh, very 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 large and um, and demanding. So, but it is an area that needs to be focused under uh, broadly, and it really needs to be something that governments and larger multilateral organizations need to come together to work on and support uh, one another on to really try to combat a lot of human trafficking or even just various forms of sexual assault. Um, and we do a lot of our programming in that gender space and really working with women across the board that um, have been victims of or um, have, have have known people that have, that have been involved or, or, or been a victim of that. And, and just provided services to them. And, and, and in terms of like that specific issue, because obviously it's, um, IDRF is, is doing a lot of the, the, the immediate needs of, of the refugees, but now with human trafficking, are, have you seen trends like in all the countries that IDRF is operating? Is there certain trends that it's increasing or is it in every country or just a few countries? So it's in, it's oftentimes in in, in most countries. Uh, it hasn't been something that we've done in depth research on uh, to really understand which countries have more cases of it. However, uh, there are elevated cases and heightened cases, especially when thinking of the refugees. Any country that has higher higher number of refugees is where you oftentimes see a lot of that, or oftentimes where you have countries in which refugees are and they want to migrate elsewhere. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of Syrian refugees that are in Turkey, and often and they all want. Uh, many of them want to go to uh, to Europe, and and just a, lot, a few two two three days ago, while we were in Turkey, uh, Erdogan mentioned that he's opening the border uh, between Turkey and 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 and, he, and Greece, and so there are thousands of people that rush towards the border there, only for them to receive tear gas and 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 whatnot and rubber bullets to stay within Turkey. But that's a good moment right there for people to still use human trafficking and trafficking as a way to get out of Turkey and go to some of their other countries. However, in the scenarios, that is where um, many, many women and children and, and everyone is, there, there are heightened risks and issues that they face. And and so it's like each each country has its own host of challenges, infrastructure, humanitarian aid-wise, and it, it, we, we talked about them earlier, the Uyghur people, and they are based uh, in the, the Xinjiang province of China, and you're operating in very difficult areas as well. Uh, so, in that particular case, are are you also working on the ground there, or how do you how do you navigate and help people there? No, no, we're not. So, uh, right now, I believe it's uh, completely impossible for any uh, charities or, or organizations to work in East Turkestan at the moment. Uh, it's uh, yeah, there, there's nothing that we can do now there or, or to provide any aid or anything there. But we are helping uh, the Uyghur refugees in Turkey, those who are in Turkey at the moment, and uh, providing them with with, with uh, food aid um, and in the future healthcare um, in in, East, in in Turkey. And with regards to like a lot of uh, refugees are also coming from Afghanistan to many parts of the world, and uh, there was a huge population in in Pakistan for some time, and many have come from Afghanistan uh, as migrants on, on on in various routes to come to Europe, and then also the the migrants from North Africa that that are braving these very rickety boats and, and with their families and their children to, to kind of come to, to Europe. So 
Now, coming to the European side and the refugee uh, places there, does IDRF have to do any work in countries, uh, Western countries that 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 are uh, hosting refugees, or or the countries typically Western countries will will have a system in place to handle a lot of these immediate humanitarian aid issues. Uh, the only country that 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 we do some of that work in is, is, is Turkey. Um, Aside from that, we do we do we do do quite a bit of work in Guyana, um, and Guyana has been seeing some refugees coming in from Venezuela um, into into their country because of the challenges that they see there. So we are doing some work in Guyana uh, to that tune. But for the most part, a lot of our efforts are in a lot more of the developing countries, the countries where people are uh, fleeing from, um, and also the host country that is receiving a lot of the refugees because eighty percent of them are going there, and that and and we're more focused on that eighty percent that are going. To to the uh, the the developing countries in the hot zones in in in, in the, the areas where where, where it's uh, the most yeah. challenging. So, yeah. Nabil, this has been such an amazing conversation. Like the the depth. Like I, I know we can keep going uh, for a long every region, of time. every country. We yeah, can but break I'm sure it down. we're gonna we're gonna have a part two and I'd to talk to. about other programs uh, that that IDRF is doing. As as closing our conversation. If you want uh, a message that uh, that you'd like to share with our listeners, um, just with your personal insight, your understanding of this work, uh, what uh, what other uh, what other uh, advices could you give our, our audience? Mm-hmm. Well, I, what I'd say is 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 to remain, um, in a sense, optimistic and and positive about the work and, and and impact that we're making around the world, and also here in Canada. I think that uh, when we look at the world, it's a very challenging time, and it's an evolving time, and it's a time when, uh, you know, uh, it's 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 easy for us to all give up, and it's easy for us to just step back and think that we can't do anything. But I think the little we all do, whether it be in our communities here uh, or communities abroad, is important, and it's important important to stay connected and it's important to also share our successes and also share our failures. Um, and I say that because by sharing your failures, you can prevent others from falling into those same gaps. So always sharing your failures, sharing your successes and talking about what it is that we all need to do to come together to support people in need is important. And if anyone just wants to hear more about like the work that IDRF does, you can always see uh, visit us at IDRF.com. We're also, we have a, a big uh, a women's campaign uh, happening at the moment where we're showcasing all of our women's programs so you can visit idf.com slash woman and, and, and just broadly just to kind of work together and just recognizing that uh, we as a globe have committed to the achievement of our sustainable development goals by 2030 and we have 10 years to go and at our current rate we're not going to reach them so it's going to need it's going to need more commitment from the civil society it's going to need more commitment from government it's going to need more commitment from the community from every group you name it we're all going to need to come together to try to reach our sustainable development goals and I'd love to on uh, part two to talk a lot more about that and, and, and how we can all kind of coordinate and work together. Absolutely. Uh, and Nabil, uh, thank you so much for your time and and I'm really uh, heartened by the work that IDRF is doing. I, I understand a lot more work needs to be done, a lot more resources need to be deployed, but like you say, we, we do what we can within our ability, our scope, with the resources we have and then by the purpose of this podcast is to tell the stories like your story and then the stories of the people that IDRF has impacted and any other stories if there are any uh, uh, people that you know that have a unique story uh, around the issue of, of being a refugee please do let us know and we're, we're yeah, happy we'll to, to to share those stories thank you very we'll much sure. thank, thank you. you guys so much for having me appreciate it thank Bye-bye. you Nabil. bye now if you have any questions related to the refugee portal podcast are interested in sponsorships, interviews, or ideas, please feel free to get in touch with us at refugeeportal.org or email us at info at refugeeportal.org.